This was, a, of course, it's, a, it's another world. This is a time of a multi-camera studio work, in which you did very, very large chunks of the piece with a limited number of edits. Uh, and uh, you rehearsed it for several weeks, I think three weeks, maybe two weeks, three, three, three. three weeks beforehand. Mm -hmm. So that it, in some ways, they were called plays in those days. And in fact, this is a play. It's not a film, it's a play. Uh, and in many ways, it is quite a stage, and it transferred to the theatre very well on several occasions. It is a stage piece in many ways, uh, and it was, it was rehearsed, and though uh, many of us uh, are, are glad, when well, I'm now retired, but many glad to use film techniques these days, I think most of us old enough regret the lack of rehearsal that we had, because we lived with this for three weeks before we came into a studio. Without that, we simply could not have done it. Um, the constraints of the technicalities of the time should not be used, however, uh, as an excuse. They're not actually anything that an audience should be expected to consider, I don't think. If you're honest in the history of television, that's another matter. You can talk about that as much as you like. But I don't think the, um, we can say, oh, we'd have done it better today, or uh, I'm sorry for this. That's not the point. It's a magnificent play, and I think the, uh, I think the cast, led by Colin, were absolutely stupendous, and mm. that's my feeling today. But it's a my magnificent production. Yeah, it is. It's really also really. it's a production that seems to be pushing against the limits yeah. of what's possible <laughs> in that studio environment. Those, those handheld cameras and, and falling down used. several times. Yes, the handheld cameras. Uh, I, I think this is the first time they've been used at the BBC. The uh, ITV had used them before. Um, uh, Granada, I think, were in many ways in advance of the BBC at this time. Uh, Yes, uh, the handheld cameras were not proper cameras. They were the sort of things you have stuck up in banks. They were industrial cameras, uh, you know, and they were very, very small. Um, and the BBC was, was upset by the technical people because they, weren't, they, weren't as, they were as good as the big cameras. Oh, no. On the other hand, you could, you could wave them about. You'd try waving an image off the camera with a large camera and such, but not possible. So we could do things. The handheld camera you couldn't do otherwise. We did that. And the technical quality was not good. But then we frequently, in television those days, cut in 16 millimeter film, which is also not very good quality in those days. And nobody complained about that because it was another department mm. and that was their problem. Mm -hmm. So it was a political world as well that we were involved in. Uh, and I, I did have the cameras banned, as I mentioned in my piece. Um, uh, 11 o'clock in the morning, I was told that I couldn't have the cameras. Um, the, some of the studio sets had been designed so that only a handheld camera could get in there. Um, it's impossible to have the big cameras in. So um, eventually, after a certain amount of anger and a fair bit of anger Saxon, I said, well, then, fair enough, and every time we go into one of those shots, I'll cut to black. Uh, and uh, the head of engineering stormed off. And a few hours later, I got my cameras back again. Uh, but we never rehearsed with them. Those shots were taken for the first time by cameramen dressed as Jewish zealots in case they got in their other <laughs> companion shots. They were mixed in there with the others. I'm amazed we never got each other in shot, which is quite extraordinary. Uh, and uh, I thought the camera were, were wonderful. One thing I want to say about this period, which, which Ken will know about too, is that I don't know about today because so I'm long retired, but at this period, there was an enormous sense of enthusiasm. This sort of television drama was new. We had exciting new people like Ken and Dennis Whiting and Tony Garnett and and um, uh, Jimmy McTaggart, when you walked into the television center in the morning, it was exciting. What's going to happen today? It was a wonderful and exciting place to be. Um, and uh, we weren't too worried about realism. Uh, Dennis thought realism was boring. What do you want that for? Uh, what we wanted to was use this extraordinary space of a studio to, it's going to sound really pompous, but to create magic. And that's what we tried to do. And when that's, what you start at 10 o'clock in the morning, life's not bad. It was a very, very, very exciting period to be in. Too good. Mm. What's your gut response to the piece, Kenneth? You'd, you'd passed over to the other side, I think, hadn't you? At, yes, at the, other, the other side of ITV, <laughs> where I... <laughs> not that other side. Where I was actually doing other Potter. I mean, I think I was, I was making two pieces which couldn't be more different from content and feeling and, and technique from that. I was making a, a film called Moonlight on the Highway and another one called Lay Down Your Arms. And one of the things in common with that, and only struck me after all these years yesterday, unlike this, was that Dennis, in, in 
in many ways, was at the centre of those stories. And incidentally, almost in a corner, so was I, because both those pieces reflected interests which Dennis and I separately had developed and experiences we'd had in, in our earlier brief lives. So it was a completely different world. And the two thoughts I had about this piece, which are rather prosaic, and I'll, I'll develop more profound ones if we're here long enough, is A, where was Dennis in this piece? And I can see little peripheral pieces of where Dennis was, because he was all over the place in the rest of his plays. So I'm not saying he was an egomaniac who only wrote about himself, but most writers do draw upon themselves. And I couldn't see very much of Dennis in this, but I could see some. And the second one was where, and, and perhaps Ian has some view on this, where did he ever write in this rather epic style again? Because I don't think he did. And just to allude to something Gareth said about um, our taste in drama at that period moving on to wanting it to be film, this was largely a move by directors and producers like myself. The writers, particularly Dennis, wanted to stay more with the words, and Dennis was rather resentful of actually saying, well, we're now in the movies and we've got to make cinema. And when many years later we made The Singing Detective, I had to say to Dennis, we're going to do it all film, we can. He said, I don't want it. I want all the hospital scenes to be as if they were sitcom. And I said, well, I can see the point of that, but it was a repellent thing to me for him to say because I was so much committed to the other way. And in the end, the, the, the persuasive thing was for me to say, if you want that, I have to get you an extremely 1950s style director, and not many of them still living. If you want a real director with ambition, we'll have to do it on film. So that, that, there were two counter evolutions and revolutions that went on during that, during that period. But that takes us quite a long way from Son of Man. Ian, where do you see Potter in here? Is, is this something of his chapel childhood? coming through here, do you Oh, think? certainly. There's the kind of uh, fiery preacher yeah. in there. But uh, I think we both yelped at the sacraments uh, being sick in the streets, which is a line that he used over and over again in his yeah. political writing early on. So he's inserting little bits of himself in there as well. How do you respond to that, hearing Potter theorise in that way and maybe picking out some of the themes? Well, no, I mean... I wish I could agree with him, but I don't, uh, unfortunately. I wish I did. Uh, I have no religion, uh, and um, I, I don't feel the hound of heaven after me personally, which doesn't mean to say I don't respect everything that he said, and of course he feels those things very strongly. Uh, and uh, I don't believe that, that searching for something of a spiritual meaning in your life necessarily means talking to God. Dennis did. Fine, I can't really say any more about it than that. Really. But the centrality of that idea of, of agony, you know, that's the thing that's at the centre of this play, isn't uh, it? It's the centre of Dennis in many ways, isn't it? I mean, uh, uh, unfortunately, because you weren't the story editor, Ken, at this time, were yep. you? No, unfortunately. But we got to, uh, some, some rewrites. I really can't remember why now. Uh, and three, about three pages of rewrites arrived. What well, you asked for, or he turned... No, I can't remember. No, to be honest, no. I can't remember. Um, it was a long time ago. And anyway, three pages of rewrites arrived. And Dennis uh, wrote uh, in very tiny, perfect handwriting, always. He wouldn't use a typewriter, couldn't use a typewriter. He had terrible psoriasis, and his hands were like claws at this time. And he, um, he, he still wanted to write with a, a pen on paper. And the rewrites arrived, and they were dotted with spots of blood and caught his own grease because his pen had been strapped to his hand. It makes you look at somebody's rewrites with a slightly mm. different eye, I have to say. Although, I, to be honest, I can't remember why we asked him. He was in hospital at the time, and he was in great pain. And Dennis was in pain for a lot of his life. And I think Dennis, well, he said to me, I don't know, Ken will know better than me, that um, he sometimes worried that if he, if he lost his illness and lost his pain, he'd lose his talent. That, I think, is tied up with his search for God in a way that I personally don't feel, but I thoroughly respect. I'm sorry, that's probably not an answer to your no, question. I was just going to follow, follow on yeah. from that, really, because you talk of him being in hospital when he wrote it. He was there yeah. for two months. Yeah. And he, it was at that point that he got very interested in this idea which Sing the Detective develops very much, which is that when someone is stuck in a bed for a very long period, they mm. eventually turn in on themselves. And they analyze themselves. And it, it, it was the beginning of his interest in this idea of the sovereign self, this thing that we have in childhood. It's very important. Which is key, key key theme. In, the, in the 80s, yeah. I mean, yes. not, not long before he died. Because remember that from, this is what, 69 or 70? 69. 69. Mm. Dennis only had 
until 1994 for the rest of, the rest of his life. That was the span. It was very contracted. And the publicity, the amount of work that he, he produced or wrote during that time, you know, I don't know, 30 or 40 dramas, and then the, the amount of work which was pr prose and reviews and stuff from all kinds of sources, which Ian in his book, The Art of Invective, has uncovered, makes me more astonished than I ever was when he was alive. But who was this man, and how did he manage it? You know, it is quite, in a sense, miraculous. I mean, one of the things that the biblical story here doesn't deal with is miracles. But Dennis, in a way, was a kind of walking miracle in his life, and an agonized one. I mean, it would be very hard to say that Dennis had periods of great happiness. One of them was under the influence of a particular drug he took just before he wrote Pennies from Heaven, which was in the 75, 76, 77. And during that period, Dennis un un acquired a joie de vivre and a lightness of step and a daringness about the possibilities of life, which sustained for a couple of years and left him when the drug had to be moved on from. And when do doctors said, if you, do if you don't give up this one, the side effects will kill you. And there was a point in the, in the mid-'80s, I can't remember exactly why, when, when he said to me, I'm on a, on a drug which was uh, vitamin A related. And I'd never looked up to find out what exactly vitamin A, vitamin A gives you. And it allows me to function, it allows me to work. But the doctors have said they take no responsibility for, for what may happen. And he said in a quite a melodramatic way, well, I suppose we were in a bar or somewhere, he said, you're looking at someone who has unique medical characteristics. And that was about 1987, 88, and 1994. He was, he was dead of, of, of cancer. And if one wanted to be really lurid or melodramatic or perhaps truthful, I would say there was a Faustian bargain which Dennis made with the limits of his own body, and he paid the price. But what a glorious price to pay. And, and you know, how great were the dividends during that short period? It, it took a lot to knock him out, I think, his productivity. I think it was the sixth, when he was in the hospital writing Son of Man, he was writing a weekly column for The Sun yeah. as well. I mean, it's, <laughs> yeah. and then I think it was 1972, which was the very worst uh, mm. period in hospital. He stops completely. But I think the moment he's out, he, I think he's, getting, he's mm. getting commission mm. after commission straight away mm. after that. Mm. Mm. To what use is he putting the story of Jesus? In this piece, you know, look, looking at it now, it's a it's, piece it's from 1969. It's a year after the uh, the year of the barricades in in Paris. You know, th yeah. there are there are all sorts of little political groups like this meeting and proselytizing, aren't there? Is there something of the atmosphere of the politics of the period getting into this story, Ken? Incidentally, and accidentally, I think, because what he never really touched, you know, the heart of what most of his contemporaries, including partly me. We're at, you know, because I made a film around that period with Jean-Luc Godard, so I knew where the, you know, where the, where the struggle was. Dennis delivered to me this play, Moonlight on the Highway, where the resort for comfort and progress was not uh, anything, was not LSD, was, was not Jean-Luc Godard, was not marching in the streets, was not political action, but listening for comfort to the music of a, a singer who died in 1941 and who thrived in, in the 10 years before. So it was completely bizarre and out of place. And yet from those sources, rather than the sources of his, con his contemporaries and, and it, that generation, the richness of Dennis's later work came. So he's, he's a, a terrific figure, but a paradox wherever you look, a towering one. I, I think Son of Man is kind of really the beginning of that sort of 10-year stretch of religious plays as well, which kind of really concentrated, I think. Would yes, you agree and, with and that? Th there's a lot there. And, and if any of you come on Thursday, um, I have to negotiate um, three rather odd pieces, one of which was directed by Gareth and we thought didn't exist again, called Emergency Ward 9. Oh, uh, totally different. <laughs> that evoked that a little bit. And two pieces of, of television of Dennis, one of which is the, 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 the program that was put out on the night he died, which I haven't seen since then and I won't see until it's on on Thursday deliberately. And the other is a episode, a, a segment in the Melbourne Bragg's Southbank show, which was then a rather routine piece of television, the programme, not the item. And what you have in the, uh, the segments either side of Dennis is an interview with Ingrid Bergman, who was still alive, and a piece by Ken Russell about Elgar's house. And this was on ITV in prime time. And there is Dennis just really being given the, 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 the sort of literary career checkover by Melvin, without Melvin being other than respectful. And it, of course, recognising Dennis was 
a major writer of his time, but he isn't really settled into that major status he had. And a lot of what he talks about there are some of those plays, um, particularly Joe's Ark, which is about a girl dying of cancer, and Traitor, which is about a man agonizing in betrayal. And I was very touched by all this because I don't think I'd seen that piece before. And I can see Dennis going through an evolution of, of preoccupation with those things, which he then moves out of and becomes something more mature and more wide embracing and, and away from you know, the extension of his own agonies. I think he becomes a, a bigger figure and a greater writer because he moves through that particular phase. And I think you're right, this was the start of that phase. And I can see in the Christ figure, obviously the agony, the things which are obvious, but the one which, of course, is there very much and is there at the beginning and the end, is the doubt. Is it me? Am I someone with something to say? Am I someone who's going to be listened to? And he never really expressed that you know, in a kind of little daily way, and it's there in quite a small way, as is, um, and I'm sorry there isn't more of it in the play, there's a little illusion to the fact that, you know, there's, a, there's another gender which has something else to say, and that scene, you know, the scene with Patricia Lawrence mm -hmm. with playing mm -hmm. Pilot's Wife, was there any more of that? Mm, no, no. no. It, Where you, you, I you, felt, you I have the, fe the female yes. voice... Yes. coming in, and of course, yes. Dennis went in and out of his attitude to women, and in yes. the end, he was accused more of, of you know, neglecting them with, with good intentions rather than delivering anything, but I could see there the beginning of something he didn't develop, and he developed so much that he didn't have time in his life to pursue, but thank God for what did come to fruition. Mm. Gareth, was there space in the rehearsal room for God? As it were, were you? Were you? Was there room for theological debate <laughs> about? But what was being portrayed here, and whether or not we were? Were there believers in as, the cast? Yeah, I think so. As Brian hasn't come back, has he? Brian would think come so. back. Yes, because uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Brian is uh, uh, a very powerful personality, as we all know, and quite different. I won't say to, to control. Yeah, that would be quite the wrong word. But uh, Brian wanted to talk theology all the time. Uh, and so we had to ban it, really, because otherwise <laughs> <laughs> he would have boomed away happily and we would never have got any rehearsals in. A simple practical problem, not a theological problem, a simple practical problem of the time. Uh, yes, there was a certain amount of interest. I mean, um, there were, there were uh, un unbelievers. There were, uh, 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 there were some probably Jewish members of the cast, probably, I can't remember, um, and, and, and Christians. Um, but I think we all came together the fact that even if you, you don't believe in, in Jesus Christ, if you don't believe in his existence, or you don't believe this man uh, actually uh, was the son of God, you, no one can deny that he's a fantastic man who has influenced the world, most of the world, for 2,000 years, despite the best efforts of the church at times. I mean, he's done absolutely, you know, he's an absolutely... I mean, just a wonderful, wonderful man. That, for me, is enough, mm. personally. That's my own personal view. Uh, a lot of members of the cast felt, felt differently. Um, but we did, 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 was there mm. a, a stage, which did happen with other productions, <coughs> where quite often the lead actor, I can remember with Alan Doby in a, in a, piece, mm. a, a piece called um, Double Dare, mm. where the director, John McKenzie, who's a very great director, mm. couldn't satisfy the actor's consternation about what the character really was. And Dennis would then not actually get out of his hospital bed if he was incapacitated, but would make a supreme effort to, to come to the studio or the set and actually give some account. And I wonder whether anyone in the cast of the Son of Man asked you or wanted to ask Dennis, well, who is he? Is he, is he the one? Because, of course, it isn't the soul. Do you know, I don't think so. No. Uh, but, but it was a long time ago, and I'm getting older, my memory may have gone, but I don't remember that uh, as happening. I also think that, um, if, I, if I can form it how to say this, but Colin's a sort of actor, um, now he's a highly intelligent actor, and he's going to want to know what he's talking about at a simple level, of course he is. Mm -hmm. But he also, uh, like a good Shakespearean actor, uh, can speak iambic pentameter and develop the thought th with a line, not think it before and then say it. He mm. can actually, mm. out it comes on the verse, as it were, and the verse will contain the, the magic of the piece as well. And Dennis is, is a magical writer. Mm. So, all right, he's not writing an iambic pentameters, but it is high. Actors found, they very rarely wanted to change anything he'd ever said, which is a mm. rare event in rehearsals. And he, they would, frankly, let the lines take them on rather 
them become pedantic about the meaning. Yeah. The, the, the emotion which they would understand by some means known to actors, and it's very real, it does not necessarily require mm -hmm. an absolute, complete running analysis at all times.